All right, so by way of quick introduction, I'm glad I didn't have to throw him in. <laughs> I am uh, Kirk Adams. I um, actually just live just north here in this neighborhood, just north of the Central Christian Church. Uh, my wife, Janae, and I have five children we're raising. I'm a small business owner, employ 22 people right here in Mesa with an office in Apache Junction in Yuma. I ran for the State House for the first time in 2006. I won, <coughs> frustrated with what I found. I ran against my own Republican speaker at that point. He was a gentleman almost twice my age, had been there for a considerably long period of time. And I ran because I didn't feel like he was being bold enough. I felt like there was a lot of political gamesmanship going on and I'm not focused on the big problems. I was elected speaker in 2008, resigned that position in 2000, April 2011. I'm running for Congress now. So that's the very brief uh, biography on me. My commitment to you today, the time that we have together, is uh, if I don't uh, agree, I'll let you know. Uh, I won't uh, be here to pander, um, and I'll tell you exactly what I think. If I think I, if I'm conflicted on an issue, I'll try to explain why I'm conflicted on an issue, and tell you exactly what I feel and think. So, number one, uh, the purpose of government is to protect our God-given inalienable rights. Period. That is the number one focus of government. What is number two? An inalienable right, the founders believed, was a natural right, uh, something endemic to every human being, even a God-given right. Not something that government could grant, but only something that government should protect. Number three, the Constitution is perhaps more relevant today than it ever has been. The further we get away from it, the more important it becomes to us, particularly if we have hope of restoring the country to its former glory. Uh, four, no, the Second Amendment should not be modified. No guns should not be registered. Number five, Social Security, I can find um, no provision in the Constitution uh, that would constitutionally justify Social Security. Proponents of Social Security will point to the General Welfare Clause under Article I, Section 8, Clause 1, I believe it is, but I believe that's a misinterpretation. Promoting the general welfare was originally intended to mean that tax dollars raised by the government cannot be used for specific interest groups or regions of the country, but they must be used for the general welfare of the entire country. Further in that question, um, should it be phased out, I think is a very important question. Um, rather than phasing out Social Security, which I don't think uh, would be politically possible and we would be tilting at windmills, I think it should be dramatically changed so that in time it does not uh, nearly resemble what it is today. I believe in private accounts for younger workers, the freedom to invest that money and keep that money with an account in your name, not in the government's name, so you're not uh, dependent on IOUs from the federal government for your retirement. Uh, number four, I do favor an audit to the Federal Reserve. I would have voted for the bill that passed the House today. Um, as an interim step, while we wait for that audit, I would support a proposal by Congressman Paul Ryan, which would reduce the mandate of the Federal Reserve <coughs> to its original intent, which was a stable money supply, and not to manipulate the economy or employment. That is, I think, an interim step that is necessary. It would be a, a net benefit to the country, to the economy as a whole. It would reduce the power of the Federal Reserve in the meantime while that audit is completed. On an ongoing basis, uh, the best disinfectant is sunshine. And a transparency, uh, transparency in the activities, the investments, the membership, and so forth of the Federal Reserve, um, I think that's where it begins before we know what to do with it. Um, I do not uh, favor the United Nations. Um, furthermore, um, I do not believe that U.S. troops uh, should be under U.N. command. Um, I think it was wrong uh, for President uh, George Bush to go before, wrong for President George Bush to justify action in Iraq based upon the U.N. resolution. Um, I thought it was weakening to our country for us to go to the United Nations and essentially uh, beg permission to do something that if we really felt we could have done, the Constitution provided uh, an ample pathway to do that. 
Um, there are, I cannot think of a UN treaty that I agree with. Um, perhaps there is one, but I cannot think of one. The ones that you list are certainly ones that I would oppose. Um, in fact, I used to be involved with an organization called United Families International, um, which lobbies for uh, national sovereignty and family issues at the United Nations. I wasn't, I was just a volunteer here locally. But it did some time before I looked up the rights of the child and what the latest was on that. And I came across a very Orwellian website to sponsor by the United Nations using cartoons aimed at children. And uh, it was very creepy. If you want to learn a little bit, if you want to be creeped out, I suggest you Google it. And uh, um, you will become infuriated as I did as a father watching that. Nine, I am, uh, I don't like paying income taxes. I'm not in favor of the income tax. Um, I would uh, favor a consumption tax. I think a consumption tax, in theory, is the most efficient form of taxation. A um, pathway to that, or an interim step, would be a flat tax system on your way there. Um, any consumption tax that I support, uh, must include, uh, along with it, a repeal of the 16th Amendment. Um, ten. I will confess to you that in preparation for this uh, meeting, this is the first time that I've read Ron Paul's uh, private medical option plan. And um, I, healthcare, pre-market healthcare policy is an area of expertise for me. And I have to tell you, I don't think he's received nearly enough credit uh, for his plan. Uh, there are a few tweaks that I would make to it from a free market perspective. If you're familiar with it, he calls for a 100% uh, refundable tax credit. Um, I think that's a fabulous idea. I would tweak it by making it an advanceable refundable tax credit. The premise of his entire plan is that you put patients back in charge of their health care with their doctors and you eliminate third party bureaucrats where those bureaucrats be government bureaucrats or insurance company bureaucrats. There's a missing element to his plan, which is in my own plan for health care reform, and is the issue of price transparency. You cannot have a functioning market unless there is price transparency. In other words, you cannot act like a consumer and make economic decisions unless you have the ability to compare price, features, and benefits between various products and services. You would never purchase a television from Best Buy without knowing the price or how its features and benefits compare, yet you'll walk into a hospital, receive medical care, knowing no idea what the cost is. Is it any wonder that the economics of our health care system don't work? And that was even before Obamacare That's made much work. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Under what conditions would you, re uh, number 11, I won't read them, I'm sorry. Number 11. Um, I do not support raising the debt ceiling, but the question is under what conditions might you support it? Um, when I originally started this race, I thought I was a believer in the cut, cap, and balance approach. But there's, an, there's a flaw, uh, at least in the cut, cap, and balance approach that was proposed during the debt ceiling uh, debate. And that flaw is, what, is, is it that it included no dealing with the entitlement system which represents 50% of everything the federal government spends in just three programs. Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And 10 years from now, that'll be nearly 70%. Under no circumstances should a congressman consider raising the debt ceiling even on a temporary basis unless there is significant cuts, change, or reforms, or all of the above, to the current entitlement system. Because absent that, anything else simply is a lie, will not work, and it's just intended to get us through a political crisis. Twelve. A congressman derives his authority from Article I, Section 8, where it enumerates 20 powers uh, that Congress has. No, it's 20 powers, not 20,000 powers. That's the things <laughs> that you didn't think that we have. Uh, the most important, uh, which is an interesting term, um, obviously, so I'm going to name a few that I think are very important, but it's like I have five kids, how do you pick your favorite? But clearly, there are important powers that impact all of us. And when I say important, I'm not meaning my 
you know, prioritizing, but these are powers that impact all of us. Article 1, Section 8 gives them the power to tax, to raise revenues. That is an incredibly important power because it impacts us. The power to incur debt in behalf and in the name of the United States, that is an incredibly important power. The power to regulate commerce between the states, that's an incredibly important power. We know how important it is because they've completely abused it and use it to expand federal power. The power to uh, coin money and regulate the value thereof. A very important power which they have subcontracted to the Federal Reserve. Uh, and fifth would be obviously um, the power to declare war. What an awesome power to put other people's children in harm's way. <laughs> so, um, let's see. That was 12, correct me if I'm wrong. Number 13. Um, this deals with the uh, with war powers. I think we can say with certainty that there has been a constitutional argument in this country since World War II about the authority, the balance of authority between the executive branch and the Congress as it relates to military intervention. In 1973, Congress passed the War Powers Resolution. Um, they actually overrode President Nixon's um, veto of this, so they had more than a two-thirds uh, majority. And the idea was that they were going to start to sort of punch the executive in the nose to start to take some of this power back. Um, and they require within notice to Congress within 48 hours, and you can only be there for 60 days without express authorization, declaration of war. Um, Congress has ignored, frankly, um, their own resolution since then. Uh, Kosovo was an example of ignoring that when uh, President Clinton extended the, his time period under the War Powers Resolution. Um, I have conflicted feelings about this, um, and I'll, where my confliction comes in is the Constitution is pretty clear he declares war. The Constitution also places the President as the Commander-in-Chief, and we live in a time of, of the technology and the weapons technology that we have um, where an attack can be levied against the interests of the United States. And I specifically mean the interests of the United States at a moment's notice, which requires the Commander-in-Chief to act quickly. I think the answer for this is the Congress, the Congress must execute and defend their constitutional prerogatives. And they have many constitutional prerogatives, and the power of the purse or the appropriations is perhaps chief among that. I'm sure there'll be a follow-up question to that, we'll get back to that later. Um, I had never thought about military conscription until I saw this question. Um, I read uh, Ron Paul's views on military conscription, um, where he says that military conscription is slavery. Um, I don't think I go uh, that far. In fact, I know I don't. I've yet to meet a veteran of uh, a World War II vet who would certainly define his service as slavery. Uh, but I think this goes back to the, to the general discussion of when this country goes to war, why we go to war, and how that process actually happens. Um, I do not support... We're at that point where Already? we probably need to change to uh, questions. I would like to ask everyone to remember this is where we ask them questions and we are, our purpose here is not to debate with them on the issues. So if you have a question, let him answer it and then we move to another question. Is that okay? Sorry to get through. There's a lot of questions. You were the first your your first bill that you face in Congress is a 5% cut on every single department, including defense, social security, Medicaid. It's a yes or a no. 5% across the board. Yeah, Five percent is not enough, not nearly. But enough. if that's the bill, though, yeah. it's well, five percent. Yes or no? If that's the only bill I have to yes. vote on, yes. Okay. Thank you, Miss Lady Uh Yes, I I got politically involved probably about four years now, and one of the things I've seen the most disheartening is how the Senate basically is unaccountable to the people. Yes. And when they impose the Seventeenth Amendment, yes. they took the rights basically as a people to do something about it. How do you feel about repealing the 17th Amendment? I would support a return to the original intent of the Constitution. 
as it relates to the state's rights to select their own senators. So that would be yes. However, I think you have to go through a massive national education effort uh, to do this. The average American will view an effort to repeal the 17th Amendment today as an attack on their right to vote for the representatives. And so if we really intend to have an impact in that area, which I believe will, will shift power back to the states, you know, the, the intention was that the Senate represent the states, the House would represent the people. And that was the design of the Constitution. Um, so it's going to require a massive education effort uh, to the people all across this country, which I think has already begun, as evidenced by groups like this. Thank you. The drug war, where are you on that? Um, I view the drug war, um, obviously, I don't think anybody can can stand before you and defend the success of the drug war. Uh, because it certainly uh, has not uh, been successful. And I will admit to you, this is where I have a personal bias. Uh, because as a member of the legislature, it fell upon me to conduct the investigations into child protective services and uh, very difficult uh, child abuse circumstances. As a result of that, I spent almost a year reading case studies, uh, case files, going on ride-alongs, um, meeting with victims, um, doing a lot of investigatory work, and I can tell you that um, in every single instance, drug abuse um, was uh, the reason why uh, there was physical abuse or death of a child. Uh, it was the motivating factor, or the person was uh, tripped out on something, and there are particular drugs um, that, of course, create uh, psychotic effects that produce a violence that is unimaginable. And so um, I do not favor, as a result of that, my own experience, the legalization of drugs. Um, I do believe, though, um, that um, the way we're going about this problem today is flawed. And it's flawed simply by the results. All you have to do is look at the results. Um, so there has to be a better way to do that, uh, but I would not favor um, ending our efforts to interdict, interdict drugs that come across the border. Uh, you had a question. You raised your arms, not, not guy next to you. Yeah. Me? Yes. Yeah, when, when you get there and you're all, you know, get welcomed in, what committee are you going to go for? Well, I hope to be on the budget committee. And because what kind of, what, what, on the budget committee, you're going to have opportunities to speak to many other department heads and that sort of thing. What are you going to focus in on? I will focus in on entitlement spending. Okay. That's the whole kit and caboodle. Nothing else matters nearly as much because you don't solve the debt crisis without solving that. So you, you're a fresh voice from the people and you, you want to be much different than what we have in Washington. So you're going to be a little bit of uh, you know, fresh voice from us and Eric Cantor and Bader comes to you and says, look here. You're kind of roughing things up a little bit. If you don't knock it off, we're going to remove you from the, from the uh, committee and we're not give you campaign contributions. What are you going to do? Yeah, that happened to me in the Arizona House and I ran against the speaker and beat him. And I was told when I did that, my office would be a broom closet in the basement. <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm not... So what are you going to do? I mean, yeah, I'm going to do what I think is the... They're going to take your power away. Hey, what are you going to do? You know what? I'm going to do what I think is the right thing to do. What's that? It's, it's what I think is the right thing to represent my constituents and why I ran for Congress in the first place. Would you be willing to give up your seat on principle? If you're not willing to come home, Let's hear it. then why go in the first place? I mean, you, you, the reason why you run for Congress is to do the work of a congressman, not to be in the building, right? Well, that's not what happens after about six months. Hey, you know, okay, no, 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 no. Let's do another question. It happens a lot. Gentlemen, the black shirt, please. Thoughts on TSA? Um, as a as a father of a uh, well, as a husband, and as a father of a twelve year old daughter, uh, the activities of the TSA cause me as much concern as anybody else. <coughs> and I think this is really a function of uh, who is running the TSA. 
I know Jan Napolitano. I had the uh, <coughs> misfortune, however you want to uh, frame it, of working with her as governor. And uh, I know her personality quite well. I know her leadership style. And to say she is a top heavy is, let me rephrase that. <laughs> To say that she is top down is not an understatement, meaning she, she, she governs with an iron fist. Um, but, but uh, you know, um, one of the duties of the um, American, of, of our government, is to protect the public safety. Would you support getting rid of the TSA? You know what, entirely. we seem to work, we seem, uh, to get rid of it entirely, no, I can't say that I get rid of it entirely. I don't know enough about what the alternative solutions would be. I certainly don't want to go back to a situation where men with box cutters can take down a plane. So, you know, I, I, absent what those alternatives would be, I'm not willing to commit to that. And that's just my honest answer. Right to the Second Amendment. Yeah. Armed yeah. Right 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 pilots. Right. Mr. Adams, why should we bring our troops home? What's that? When should we bring our troops home? From where? From yeah. everywhere. From yeah. Afghanistan. From everywhere we have. Well, I think it's time to bring the troops home from Afghanistan. Now? I think now is just fine. Japan or Germany. I think now is just fine. Yeah, why do we have so many troops in the Asian... There's no reason for us Korea. to be spending the billions of dollars we're spending for our bases in Germany. Uh, Obama just opened example. up Australia. Japan may be another example. Yeah. Oh, this lady with the curly hair. Since you're talking about public safety, I was just curious. When you were in the Congress, you killed our photo radar bill. And I understand and I, I support you. However, before I could get behind you, I would need a public apology and your yeah. whole stance on photo radar. I do understand that Matt Salmon was a huge lobbyist for photo radar. Right. So your positions are both fairly the same on that. But would you publicly go on record and let me know? If you are yeah, you know, I know I've been, I've, I've seen this few blog posts, the Speaker of the House, that I somehow killed the bill. Um, as I recall... It's fine if you can just explain your position on it. Yeah, you're willing I, I, to I, 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 I will, move on. I, I will explain my, my position on it. Um, but first, I think I need to address this. Okay. Um, because if, you're, if it's the bill that I recall, it was a bill that was held in committee. Now, I could be wrong, but I actually voted against the state photo radar bill. When Jan Napolitano tried to institute photo radar, and she did it solely for the purpose of raising money. It was a budget. Item. It was a budget. Item. She included it in the budget. We all voted against that. She wanted to raise ninety million. How much ended up raising? Ten. But she counted for ninety million for purposes of passing the budget. Um, I do not support photo radar um, on our streets. There is one area where I am frankly conflicted, and that is the red light cameras. Um, that is an area where, frankly, I cannot say to you that I um, am ready to say no red light cameras. Um, and I should hate photo radar because I get plenty of those tickets myself. All right, Brown, sir. Mr. Commissioner, just a quick question. I applaud your recognition of uh, Article 1, Section 8. Um, but if we do recognize as conservatives a limited government as defined by the Constitution, uh, I just have a couple questions sure. for you with that perspective in mind. Um, so. If we are going to limit the government to certain um, certain elements, then uh, how can we justify the continuance of Social Security? Would you support a uh, um, releasing the mandate for future people to have to claim Social Security? Um, and if we do continue Social Security, uh, could you still make an argument that Obamacare is unconstitutional yet continue with Social Security? To 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 make Social Security to to answer your question, yes, I support. Complete 100% freedom of options for for younger workers to actually to eliminate the mandate. That would be, I'd be fine with that. I I'm 39 years old. I, I don't expect to see Social Security when I retire. To make it happen though, to actually make that happen, I, if we were to say tomorrow we're going to eliminate Social Security, we would have no chance of any reform at all because the American public would not accept it. And they would completely reject anything that we tried in that regard. You need to have a two-tiered approach. There are people who have defined their entire retirement, their economic means around Social Security. And that is a promise that the government has made to them, absent constitutional authority, but nonetheless they've made it to them. And so you need to have a two-tiered approach to this. The Ryan Plan, for example, 
sets, I think, a framework in Medicare how to do this by using Medicare as an example. Where if you're over the age of 55, everything stays the same. If you're under the age of 55, we eliminate these government-run programs and we go back to the private sector. And I think that's the long-term solution and actually a practical political way to accomplish it. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Thank you. Your time is up.